Hello, everyone, and welcome to another SEJ Marketing Think Tank webinar. Today, we will be joined by John L. Alderson, who carries an interesting title of Special Ops at Yoast <laughs> and is here to tell us how we can speed our websites up. And this is one of those things, you know, that we've really, really important. We've been talking about, you know, speed and, and the factors that it has in the algorithmic elements of SEO, as well as just like the experience people have with your website. So I think this is going to be a really, really great presentation. My name is Brent Satoris. I am the moderator here. And Jono, I'm going to let you just uh, give us a little bit of an introduction and tell us what kind of, you know, role you have as a special ops at Yoast. And then uh, I'll go through some housekeeping afterwards. Sure. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for turning up. This is very exciting. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know what special ops means either. Um, I think it's a, a convenient kind of made up title. I have a, a background in technical SEO and web development and analytics and a bunch of other stuff. And the job is essentially um, take bits of all of that and make sure that the product we build at Yoast, i.e. the WordPress plugin, all the other stuff is right, is right for the future, takes advantage of all the shiny new toys, is technically robust, is the best in the market, etc. So most of what I end up doing is, I guess, research and development, prototyping, um, kind of idea generation, lots of flow charts, um, lots of building things and breaking things. Um, and making sure that we um, we dog food. So I spend a lot of time making sure that Yoast as a company and Yoast.com does all of the good SEO stuff that we talk about and try and educate everyone else on. So I'm a bit of a champion for taking our own medicine. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of all sorts. Mostly I just turn up and hope that nobody's fired me um, and that I've fallen through the cracks. So yeah, it's an absolute treat, really fun. Awesome. So running through a little bit of housekeeping for everybody that's listening. Um, if during the webinar you have any questions, comments, or anything that you would like to mention, there is a question box at the bottom of your screen in the web, go to webinar control panel. Um, please type your questions there. We will gather them and we will um, answer them during our Q&A. Uh, after the webinar, please stick around. We have a quick survey that comes after every webinar. It's, it's, it's five minutes or less. It's super simple, but um, it really does help us to determine how we're doing, how we can improve, you know, and it helps the speakers get some feedback on them, their presentation. So please take the time to do the uh, survey real quick at the end. Um, lastly, the entire webinar will be recorded. It will be transcribed. It will be presented as a post uh, within a day or two after the webinar is over on Search Engine Journal. So if you, you know, want to recap or you want to share it with a friend, uh, you will be able to find it there. <laughs> Without any further delay, Jono, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. And um, just before we jump in to build on what you just said, um, I'm conscious I've got a lot of stuff to get through. So um, I'm going to go um, probably slightly faster than might be comfortable in an ideal world where we had hours and hours. But as Brent says, um, all of these slides will be available, it'll be recorded, there'll be text, and I'd quite like to get to Q&A um, fairly quickly so we can give you guys a chance to ask lots of questions. So, without further ado, let's do this thing. Um, we're going to talk about how to take your website beyond fast, because fast is no longer good enough. Um, I'm John from Yoast, we've done that. So yes, this is going to be quite fast. I talk quite quickly. I apologize when I get excited. I go very, very fast, so bear with me. Again, don't feel you have to take notes on all of this. There's links on all the slides that are curated at the end. You get all this afterwards, just strap in and feel the speed. So why are we talking about this? First and foremost, because users expect fast, not because fast ranks you better, not because fast rank makes you more money, not for any of those reasons that they're all true, but first and foremost, because users expect your website, your app and your digital experience to be fast. Um, specifically, there's a whole bunch of research here. This is from um, Market Dive quoting Google in 2016, saying that delays of over three seconds can lead to half of your audience abandoning. Just think about that for a second. The number of times when you wait three seconds for something to load, you've already lost half your audience. And what's really scary for most websites and apps and brands is in those scenarios, the analytics tags probably aren't having time to fire because the site is so slow. So you don't even know that you're losing them. It might be that your slow website is costing you half of your audience and you're not even aware. Um, this isn't an isolated stat. This is Wired Magazine as far back as 2014. And we've come a long way since then. The web is a lot faster. Consumer expectations are higher, saying half of people expect a site to load in less than two seconds. So three seconds, you're losing half your audience, and two seconds, people are already annoyed. That's the benchmark. That was the benchmark five years ago. If your website is slower than two seconds, you are irritating half of your audience. 
And we go on 2014, more stats from Radware saying 20% of users will abandon their cart if the transaction process is too slow. These aren't people thinking intentionally, this is so I'm going to click close. This is people who are subconsciously irritated or annoyed or get frustrated with those experiences and bail out. And there's a famous study, a series of famous studies um, from GQ, Google and Amazon, where they artificially introduce small delays into their timing. So Google um, added a half a second delay into their search engine results and they lost 20% of their users. Amazon famously for every 100 millisecond delay they inject to test, they lose 1% of their revenue. Those numbers are astounding. And we're talking about 100 milliseconds here. The human brain can barely comprehend, I think 300 milliseconds is close to what we perceive as instantaneous. So this is these are delays which are so, so tiny that nobody is noticing them and consciously getting annoyed. These are impacting us at a deep subconscious experiential level and we're getting frustrated and we're abandoning sites. What this says really is that whether consumers articulate it or not and whether they understand it consciously or not, Time is money, and every single millisecond could be costing you users or conversions. There's a really good tool to um, estimate how big a deal this is for you. This is from Google. It makes some general numbers and some made up stuff, but it's quite useful to play with. It tells you, um, you put in your site and your number of visitors and your average order value, et cetera, and it will estimate based on these kinds of stats, how many people are you losing and how much more money could you be making if you improved your speed. This is all good stuff. So. Given that this is the state of affairs, none of this is new. These statistics were from as far back as 2014, um, where it became apparent that all of this was quite a big deal. By that logic, we should all be on top of this and nailing it and doing really well. Well, it turns out that's not really the case. And in fact, um, this table is a bit hard to digest at a glance, but you'll see um, different industries down the side, and different countries along the top. And what this is showing is the number of seconds it takes for a website, for an average website in these sectors in these countries to be completed loading on a mobile phone on a 3G connection. These sites are taking upwards of eight, nine, 10 seconds. This is slow. This is so slow that it goes beyond subconscious irritation and annoyance into outright hatred for brands. There's a whole bunch of statistics around how much users dislike this kind of experience and how much it impacts their um, propensity to convert. This stuff is seriously bad. The thing is, this isn't gonna be for long and the world is changing. Primarily because Google, as a powerhouse of influence and authority as they are, are really very, very interested in speed for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, if you go back to July um, 9th, 2018, there was a really nice blog post with them announcing um, how important they consider speed to be. And that now it's officially part of, um, it's officially a ranking factor for mobile searches and for the scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. And they started to say that they encourage developers and more broadly, people who manage websites to think about how performance affects users' experience and to look at that across a whole bunch of user experience metrics. I think what's really interesting when you dig into that is what they're essentially saying is that speed underpins user experience, that when you are browsing a website or trying to get to a page or trying to load a product or add something to a cart, how quickly that happens is a huge component of the overall UX. And you could debate this until the cows come home, but what Google are trying across SEO and PPC and across all their own properties to optimize for is the best user experience, to give the user the best experience for the best thing that they want in that moment. So optimizing for that, whether or not Google are explicitly measuring speed or whether users are aware that speed's affecting them consciously or otherwise, yada, yada, you can ignore all of that because what's really important is that speed is a huge component of user experience, and we know that Google are keen on user experience. Um, also worth noting, if you put your tinfoil hat on briefly, that for Google, speed is the same thing as efficiency. That when we talk about slow websites, typically the reason they're slow, many, many reasons, but some of the common ones are things like loading big images or in not, not an optimized JavaScript or not compressing resources or having big clunky HTML processing all of those things, downloading them, rendering them, indexing, indexing them, costs real money for Google. Google's biggest commercial outlay, I think, and I might be misquoting, but I think their biggest cost center is crawling and indexing the web. Might be their staff that balances sometimes, but the principle is that slow websites are more expensive for Google to consume, to index, and to rank than more optimized websites. So it will always be Google's preference for people to optimize and improve the speed of their sites. Um, and it's also worth noting that even if you're sat smugly thinking you're doing quite well, 
other people's websites, because Google are pushing them to do so, will improve. They will get faster. The platforms like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter will get faster as they adopt new technologies. Essentially, the web is going to get faster overall, and consumers' expectations will increase. The fastest, best experiences they have will become their expectation for the norm. So if your website is slower than that, it's going to feel even slower still. So let's get to the meat. What do you need to do about this? What you definitely don't need to do is plan out some kind of big web redevelopment project. There will certainly be some of you amongst the audience right now saying something like, well, we know this is important and we have a big redevelopment process. It's in the plan, in the works, it's being developed, the guys are working on it. It's scheduled for Q4 2019 or Q1 2020. Do not use this approach. Speed, or speed optimization and performance optimization has to be a cultural thing baked in for the beginning. Um, otherwise, you never get there. Because by the time this big re-architectural re -architecture project launches, it will be a year late. It will be twice the budget it should have been. And then you'll be behind the curve. Your site will be slow compared to the new standards and what your competitors do. The way that you do this and the way you need to approach thinking about speed optimization is that you win by a thousand tweaks by going in every day now tomorrow, day after, every day, in and out, and spending 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, an hour, forever and ever and ever and ever. Because the web is getting faster. It isn't enough to benchmark and trying to reach a certain point. This needs to be an ongoing process. Essentially, the secret isn't to do this big ugly architecture approach. It's just to find bits of it and make it faster. But what does that mean, and where do you start? Let's arm you with some of the tools and truths that you need to understand this. Um, there are, at the heart of speed optimization, two fundamental truths that you need to understand. The first is that there's no such thing as speed, which makes this whole talk slightly difficult to give. Um, because when you start exploring that, it becomes very, very difficult to answer this question. How do you measure speed? How do you put a metric against how fast your website is? Well, you could start off simply and you could say something like, how long does it take for a page to finish loading? That feels like it makes sense. But what does that mean? Um, what happens if the server responds really quickly, but then because of the way you've encoded your images or your style sheets, it takes a long time for the page to display? Or the other way around, what happens if it takes ages for your server to wake up, but then everything downloads really, really quickly and really efficiently? Which of those scenarios is faster? Which one has the most speed? These, these words don't make sense. Um, what if the page has components that only load when you interact or when you scroll? Uh, at what point are they finished? How fast is that page? The metrics aren't good enough. We need better definitions to understand how well we're doing. Um, if I had more time, I would take you through a whole bunch of reasons why most of the tools you will have seen um, aren't very good for measuring this. Um, tools like Pingdom's web page speed test are designed to give you a false sense of comfort and are flawed in more ways than I have time to point out, but feel free to tweet me afterwards. But very, very briefly, there are a whole bunch of reasons why you want to be avoiding relying on these kinds of metrics. Firstly, their numeric performance grades, like C and 75, um, 75, doesn't actually measure the speed of your site. At least they don't usually. They tend to measure whether or not you've done certain types of techniques. Have you in, um, activated GZIP? Are you modifying your, your CSS, etc.? These aren't necessarily the same thing as is your website fast, so they're not good base benchmarks. The load time there is for the URL that I've tested at that moment in time from the location I'm testing. And if there is a variation in the temperature of the ocean where the cables are, or a sudden shift in the number of people using their computers because there's an ad break in between a major sporting game, or any number of other factors, that number is liable to be impacted possibly quite significantly. So that moment in time doesn't reflect the overall experience of my users. It's not a good way of understanding. The faster than other people testing is, um, is uh, biased against other people who are using this tool. Sure, this is faster than 91% of other sites, but that's of people who used this tool in the last 30 days to test their homepage. That's a very specific type of person with a very specific type of site and probably isn't representative of the overall market. The things which these tools do do, which is really useful, is they say, how big was this page and how many things did it load? And you don't need to sit through this webinar for me to tell you that loading fewer, smaller things will make your site faster. These aren't great ways of understanding your performance. This is the Google PageSpeed Insights tool. And until recently, it was equally nonsense. It gave you PageSpeed fast and optimization good. These aren't actionable or particularly helpful. What it did add recently is first contentful paint. 
which is a really interesting metric. And it gives you, I'll talk about it in a second, it also gives you it relative to the experience of all the people who viewed your site. Rather than giving you a number in time or a specific date, it says of all the people who viewed your site, what proportion of those had a good experience? Who was it slow for, et cetera? And you can start to see where there might be issues with, for example, people in distant countries on slow mobile devices. First content for paint is the moment when the browser first renders any text or an image or a non-white canvas. Let's translate that into English. How quickly can we show something interesting? How many milliseconds until we can put something on screen that looks like it's doing something? Rather than having a blank white page with just a spinner or a loading icon, how quickly can we make it look like it's happening? For many people, that will be a hero image at the top of the page or a logo or the navigation bar. If we can optimize our sites and our experiences in such a way that load those bits first with a minimum amount of delay and then worry about loading all the other stuff, then it feels much faster. Here's an example. This is a slightly out of date template from the Yoast.com website on one of our um, articles. And you can see there's a lot going on. Um, we have custom fonts and a big old image and an interactive nav and some personalized stuff in the header. and Things below the fold, there's a video there that loads, there's a comment section, there's lots of JavaScript, we're loading pictures of the authors. Um, if our objective here is how quickly can we show something, we're loading a lot of things at the same time that might get in, get in the way with that. Actually, if we strip all of that out, we can be a much lot more intel intelligent. We can say, actually, we don't need the image immediately. We can load that gradually. We don't need the video below the fold. We don't need the image of the author. All these things can load in, but maybe they can do it after we've loaded the um, name of the article and the main navigation so that as that page loads one piece at a time, if it's on a slow connection, the people sat there waiting start to see the important stuff first rather than waiting for a big image to load. The order that we load things in and how we choose when and where and what order they happen in is hugely impactful and we'll talk about more on that in a little bit. Um, so the good news is um, we did a load of this stuff on Yoast.com. We went through and we made those optimizations. And as a result, the site looked and felt faster. As an end user, as a human being looking at it, it felt a lot more pleasant to use. It was obvious stuff was loading. It was great, except our scores didn't change much. We were a bit gutted. We'd done all that work and our 79 out of 100 and all those metrics didn't shift. And the lesson here is really that it's important that you don't optimize for and measure your progress on those scores, that really you keep your focus on making it faster. Um, because the second rule and the second truth is that the only thing which matters is the perception of speed. How fast did this feel? And in fact, Google's um, own Lighthouse documentation say as much. They say load isn't a single moment in time. It's not a thing that happens. And there is no one metric that can fully capture that. There's lots of moments and things that happen which a user might perceive as fast or slow. It's a complex process. Um, however, given that, regardless of what your website is, or what sector you're in, or how it works, there is one golden moment that you might want to measure. It's time to interactive. So your first metric was um, first content for page. Time to interactive is how long does it take for the page to become interactive? There's lots of gum there, but let's translate again. How quickly can we make it feel ready? So if I open a page and it starts to load and I get that first content for paint moment and then I scroll on my mobile or I click something on my screen with my mouse and nothing happens or the response is jerky or janky because it's still loading, that feels slow. And even if the page loaded quickly, but my interaction with it makes it feel slow, then the page is slow. There's a fundamentally important thing to understand here is that Google, it's not likely, and we don't know for sure, but it's not likely that they're specifically measuring the actual page speed. What they're much more interested in is the perception of speed. How do users experience this? And if you make a lightning fast website that feels slow to load, you've wasted a lot of time and money. The emphasis needs to be, how do we show something quickly and how do we make it feel ready? The challenge is that perceived speed is really hard to quantify. Um, and there are lots of moving parts um, in that ecosystem. If I, um, I'm gonna show you a really scary image, which is from the web um, consortium's overview on what happens when you load a web page. It looks like this. This is all the things that happen when you type a URL and hit enter or click on a link that prompts for unload and it redirects and there's DNS and TCP and all these things. Some of these are slow, some of them are fast. Some of them are bits of your website. Some of them are in cables under the ocean. Some of them happen in your computer's CPU and processing. 
Um, and not only this, but increasingly we are entering a world of um, JavaScript frameworks like Angular and React, which happen somewhere in the processing layer. And there are service workers which sit somewhere between the request and response. And we haven't even talked about the experience after the page is loaded, because if you load it really quickly and then my interactions with it feel slow again, it may as well be slow, difficult. This is really scary and it can be really, really complicated. But the good news is, whilst once upon a time, this was magic and voodoo and art, that's no longer the case. Performance optimization is now a science. There are hard rules, there are processes, there are really easy guides and techniques you can follow to achieve this. And essentially every site in the world can load in under a second. That will take time and engineering and optimization and resources. But every site, regardless of what or how big or how complicated, can load, i.e. first contentful paint, first um, uh, uh, meaningful interaction, etc., in under a second. Essentially, you just need to follow the rules. Google has a simplified version of that chart. This is really handy. It's from PageSpeed Insights. And it breaks what happens when you load a page into four sections. The DSIT DNS lookup, the HTTP request and response, the server response time, and client-side rendering. This is one second. Now, this bit is limited by the speed of light and cables under the ocean, which makes it quite hard for you to optimize. This bit, you can. This is your hosting, your servers, your CDNs, which we'll talk about. This is your CMS, your plugins, your extensions, your themes, your add-ons. And this is your HTML, your CSS, and your JavaScript. This whole section, you can optimize the heck out of. If only there were a guide that you could take and use to follow this along on your own. And um, thankfully, there is. Um, it will come as little surprise that Google, being as invested as they are in optimizing the speed of websites, produce a huge amount of documentation and guides on just how you can go about doing this. If you take one thing away from this webinar today, it's to follow the link at the bottom of this page, which you'll get in the deck, um, and go look at the Google Web Fundamentals documentation in the performance section. You can't quite see it in, in the left now, but there are hundreds of pages here on everything from optimizing images to custom web fonts to other stuff. Essentially, everything that I'm going to tell you in the rest of this webinar is learned either from their documentation or is ways to implement it on your site or ties into the things they're saying. This is the source of all knowledge and you can go through, it's very accessible, it's very readable and you can find ways to apply stuff to your site. Because the challenge is everybody's site is different. And whilst those guides will help you with what best practice looks like, you need a method to go through and understand where you should be starting. So, where do you start? Let's go find the slow stuff. This is the secret. There is no big redevelopment project. There is no magic bullet. You just go find the slow stuff. Whilst the tools aren't good for giving you metrics that you monitor over time, they are really good for spotting issues and identifying problems. Let me give you an example. This is a web page test waterfall report for Yoast.com. Um, there's a link again. You go in, you put your domain or your URL in, and it tells you all the things that load. Let's ignore everything in the gray section for now. That's um, a whole bunch of our tracking and analytics, which I've loaded via Google Tag Manager on our site. So it loads after the page is done. You can see the yellow and green lines down the middle. That's our page finishing and then all the tracking kicking in. That means that we're not waiting for Google Analytics to load whilst we're still trying to achieve first contentful paint. What's left is quite interesting. Look at this bit. We're you don't have to be a hardcore developer to understand this. You can look at it and get clues. You can see that these four lines are images, three PNGs and a JPEG. What's more interesting is in that middle bit where they're loading, you can see that they are happening almost one at a time. There's a, a bottleneck here happening where we're waiting for some of them to finish before the next one starts. The most impactful thing that we can do to speed up this page is to remove that bottleneck because then everything that happens after that point would have happened earlier. This is the, the most impactful thing you can learn about speed optimization, performance optimization, is to look at the way in which pages load and find out what's waiting for other stuff. If you can remove those bottlenecks and change the order that things load in and get them to load at once rather than one at a time, everything else happens sooner. Um, let me show you a practical example. This is um, a different tool showing the same thing. This is Pingdom's web page test tool. And all I've done is ordered it by load time. Show me the slowest loading stuff. This second line is a tiny piece of JavaScript, tiny, 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 four kilobytes. Um, but it's taking a long time to load. That's taking what? 300, maybe 400 milliseconds to load? That's wrong. Something has gone really, really wrong here. Something about that JavaScript file is really slow. What's more interesting is look at this. You can see that that has to finish loading before that next bit fires. We've got a bottleneck. 
If that JavaScript file had taken less time to load, those other things could have happened sooner. This is the secret, this is the approach. So I sat down with one of our developers, I say we refactored, I sat down with the developer and asked him nicely. He looked at that file, he went through the code, he said, oh, okay, this bit's a bit inefficient. So we've already done a whole bunch of work making it small, but we've not made it very efficient. He changed how it worked, and we shaved the time of our site loading down from about one second to 625 milliseconds. Incidentally, this is a screenshot of um, Google's Chrome Developer Console, which if you're on Windows, you can access via F12, I think, or shift Control j um, Mac less similar, or you can right click the page. This is really useful. This is the network tab, and it's a waterfall of everything that's happening in the browser. It's the same as those other tools, but it's testing it from my browser. So I can see exactly what's going on. And you can see the timings and the bottlenecks, et cetera. You can see all of these green bars where everything is loading at once, and then all the analytics kicks in. We remove that bottleneck. That's lightning fast. The thing is, this is an oversimplification. And I've not been entirely honest with you because that 600 millisecond, 625, 625 milliseconds was on a desktop device in an office with very, very good Wi-Fi in a well-connected Western city. The world is mobile. And Google is monitoring and measuring and performing um, analyzing sites in a mobile first way. And many of our users are using mobile devices. And that's where the particularly slow pain points are. Um, on a mobile device, our site um, loads in on just about three seconds. You can see I'm emulating a 3G device up at the top. That's pretty poor. What felt fast, actually, for most of our users, was pretty slow. Remember, half of your users are annoyed at two seconds. Half of your users expect sites to be three seconds, et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty poor. So the challenge is that even for us, and trying to dog through this as much as we can, there is no magic bullet. And we're on a journey of a 1,000 tweaks. I spend an hour a week finding bottlenecks and improving and iterating. So I want to share some of the things that we've done and we've learned that you can take away and do today. These aren't your long-term plan. These aren't a strategy, but they are tips and tricks which might get you a little bit faster. Here is how you shortcut speed. Here are some quick wins, if you like. I'm going to go through each of these sections in a bit more detail, but this is the masterclass. This is the principle. You need to load less stuff, tidy up your CMS, bolt on a CDN, sort out your hosting, maybe use a static page cache, optimize your resources, and maybe use AMP. Let's explore. Loading less stuff, not rocket science, right? Um, there are some basics to this and then some more advanced. At a basic level, whatever CMS, whatever platform, whatever tool, toolkit and technology you're using, chances are you've added things onto that. If it's the easiest example is WordPress. If you're loading using plugins or extensions and integrations and third parties, they will come with a performance cost. And in many cases, that's fine. Um, it takes computers time to process things and to do things. And if these plugins and extensions are offering business critical functionality for your website, then you need them. And there's not a huge amount you can do about them other than maybe rebuilding them yourself or, or shipping your own stuff. In many cases, you'll be stuck with them. However, it's always worth regularly assessing all of those add-ons and bolt-ons and integrations and saying, not only do I need this, but is the trade-off of the speed and the time it takes to run it worth the business value it, um, it, uh, we get in that trade-off? And sometimes the answer to that might be no. It's worth considering the speed um, cost of these add-ons. Um, absolutely rigorously interrogate the number of bytes transferred. When you look in the um, when you look in these tools, the web page tests, the Chrome Developer Console, it will always say you transferred 2.3 megabytes or 826 kilobytes. Try and shave those off. And well, you're not going to make radical changes very often, but you might find that if you spend 10 minutes improving three images, you can remove 10 kilobytes. And then next week, you might make some tweaks to a font, and you might remove another two kilobytes. If you do that every week, those ones and twos of kilobytes add up, and you might find that you improve your speed significantly. Because everything else aside, you're still having to ship code and instructions to your users' computers. If you can reduce the amount of stuff you're sending, everything else gets faster. Often overlooked, um, your browser has to interpret the H your users' browsers have to interpret the HTML and CSS and JavaScript of the website when their browsers receive it. That is computationally expensive. It requires um, your computer, your browser to interact with your um, your hardware, your graphics card, all those other sections. You need to be thinking about simplifying your HTML and streamlining that structure. 
I'll touch on it in a bit more depth in a moment, but custom fonts, unless they're done in a very specific way, can be hugely impactful on performance. I would look to fall back to system fonts wherever you can as a quick win, or I'll touch on some more advanced techniques if you um, are convinced that you want to use custom fonts. Um, really, really overlooked. Look for the detail. The places you'll find that you can shave those bits of one and two kilobytes off often aren't big, obvious stuff. They're things like use fewer colors, do you really need those boxes to have a board around them? Do you really need to be using drop shadows? Do you really need six icons when four in a different color might do? Those are the areas where you find all those small incremental areas, especially things like those little details. And there's, I haven't got a link to it, but there's a really interesting blog post on Trello's developer blog. Um, Trello is a productivity tool, if you're not familiar, looking at how much they improved the performance of their tool by removing drop shadows and one pixel borders on their cards. Tiny, tiny tweak, huge impact on those tangible first content for paint and interaction metrics. JavaScript is the devil. Uh, JavaScript is wonderful and empowering and flexible and a great tool for all sorts of things, but unless you have very sophisticated developers using it very carefully, chances are that's one of the main causes of your bottlenecks, and we'll come on to some examples. Some advanced stuff you can do, um, again, there's resources for all of these, there's links, you can go through the Google Web Fundamental documentation, but these are definitely things you should be looking up. You should be lazy loading your images, you should be deferring non-critical JavaScript, and you should be loading things asynchronously where you can. If these are scary words, go look through the documentation, they're very simply introduced and they're very accessible. And um, one of the key things you should do is avoid loading things from other domains. If you are loading, say, jQuery from a content delivery network, or you're loading custom fonts from Google's font CDN, every time your website talks to another domain, every time your user has to load something from another www.example.com, that adds a huge amount of time and often bottlenecks other resources. If you can save those resources locally and serve them locally, that'll be hugely impactful. Um, this is really advanced. You can look at DNS and asset prefetching. Um, there's a really good guide here to how that works. And the principle is rather than letting your browser just work through your HTML and work out what it needs to do, you can tell it in advance that you're going to want to load things from an external source. You can say to your browser, say to your user's browser, before you start loading this page, by the way, I'm going to ask you to go and get something from another domain. Can you start planning that now? and then you remove those bottlenecking behaviors. That's really impactful if you can't um, localize those, um, those resources. Tidying, tidying up your CMS is critical. So many people will be running WordPress, other people on other stuff. I'm a bit of a WordPress nerd. This is my go-to tool for tidying up what WordPress is doing. This is Query Monitor. I don't think I have a link until the end, but you can Google it. Um, it tells you everything that's loading. And a lot of this is very technical and very developer-y, but the nice bit is anywhere where it finds a bottleneck or an issue, it'll flag it in big red text and it'll tell you, and it'll tell you in plain enough language that you can then talk to a developer or work out what you're gonna do about it. It's really nice for spotting those bottlenecks or things like this plugin is making 500 database queries. You can easily see where there are issues. If you're not on WordPress or if you wanna go a bit deeper, um, New Relic's really nice. There's other stuff that's similar, do a bit of Googling around, but the principle here is you install this in your server. It will take somebody technical and it will only take them about 10 minutes, but you'll need somebody to do some console voodoo. Um, but this runs inside the system and it tells you this particular file is slow or this query is slow or this plugin's slow. And what's really nice is all of its reporting metrics are in human terms. It says 40% of users visiting this page are likely to be frustrated or angry or, or, or happy. Um, it's a really nice way of looking at it. Um, whilst I keep saying that there's no magic bullet and no magic wand, there really is, sort of. Um, you should definitely be using a CDN. If you're not familiar with CDNs and you're not already using one, I would definitely recommend Cloudflare. Um, other options exist, but none of them are as free, as powerful, or as fast. Um, if you're a more complicated business, you might want to do some research. But if you are new to this and you just want an easy win, take 20 minutes, install Cloudflare in front of your domain. You follow their guide. It's really easy. You just point your um, domain at it and click the buttons, and it speeds up your website. How does it work? Um, on the left, and I'm not affiliated with Cloudflare. I genuinely believe this is the best thing in the world. On the left is what a normal website looks like. People just visit it. On the right is a Cloudflare setup. They advertise heavily on their security, um, but the speed is really the thing. And the principle is it sits in front of your website as a kind of shield and optimization layer. Um, and when you log in, you get a whole bunch of stuff like this, like automatically minify all my resources and automatically compress all of my images. And it just works. It's really, really powerful. It does a hundred other things. It's, the free version is 
90% of everything you'll need. It's really stonkingly good. If you want to do some advanced stuff with it, and for clarity, we um, use some heavily advanced stuff with this on Yoast.com. Um, you can do lots of conditional logic with page rules. You can say, don't cache this image if somebody is logged in, or own, change the cache headers on this so that it works differently. You can really customize stuff, which is helpful for websites that have um, particularly non-standard or complex setups. Um, you want to get really sophisticated, you can use Cloudflare to run code on what they call on the edge, which is in their servers around the world. So you can do things like localization much more easily than you might be able to in your system, or you can fix bugs without ever having to touch um, the system itself's code. Um, really, the most sophisticated thing you can do with it is start looking at server push, which I don't have time to go into. But if you're interested in some really cutting edge stuff, go check out this deck. It's by a friend of mine called Tom Anthony from Distilled. And he talks about some of these techniques purely through an analogy of trucks going up motorways. It's absolutely delightful. So next, take a deep breath. Um, how do you get better hosting? So this is my favorite analogy for how websites work. And it's true or less true for some different systems. It's particularly true for how WordPress works. Imagine your website as an enormous conveyor belt running through a factory. And it's got arms and branches in different directions. And there are bits coming in and out. Every plugin, every extension, every integration that you run, everywhere where you do custom code, everywhere where you do something complicated, those packages get manipulated or lifted onto a different track or opened up and the contents inspected are changed. And the more you do of that, the more complicated and convoluted and slow that system becomes, not because it's inherently slow, but because there's lots of stuff that's got to happen. It's a really nice analogy. And there are two things, two main things you can do to speed that up and remove those bottlenecks. You can reduce the number of branches and complex things you're doing with those parcels and just ship them. But then they're less exciting and less interesting and less featured or you can make the conveyor belt faster. Um, the speed of your conveyor belt is one of the most impactful things your hosting can influence. Now, I have some recommendations for some hosting companies. Um, I'll caveat this heavily. Everyone should very much go and spend a lot of time doing their own research and finding a good fit for them. These are not for everybody. These are brands that I've had good personal experience with and would recommend potentially depending on your different sizes of sites. I want to give a particular shout out to Servbolt, who are awesome, who I host my sites with. Um, lightning, lightning fast, excellent for WordPress, really, really cool. Um, a few quick rules. If you're spending less than $20 a month on hosting, just go make sure that you're not compromising on the quality and the customer service and the hardware. Like hosting is a wrapper for hosting. Hosting is just renting computers and computers have CPUs and RAM and hardware. And if you're getting cheap hosting, chances are you're getting cheap computers, which is going to make things slower. Um, if your hosting company has an animal for a logo, you are almost certainly on a path to losing and go and review that immediately. That trends remarkably well as a, as a life rule. Um, you could consider using a static page cache. Um, if you're on WordPress, the two on the left are two of the leading ones. Um, if you're not, then things are a bit more complex for you, but look at Redis or Varnish. Varnish. The principle for this is that if you go back to the, um, the conveyor belt metaphor, rather than every user triggering your website to load up, to request all its themes and plugins, to go through that process, to manipulate the outcome, to why don't you just save that page and the outcome? or the save that database query and whatever it said. And then you don't need to rerun it every time. You can just give people the outcome. Now, there are some pros and cons with this and some complications. It's not going to be right for everybody. But if you want an easy win and you're on a simple site, this might be a good fix for you. And if you're doing this and Cloudflare, then something like WP Rocket will automatically cache all of your pages and your server responses. And then something like Cloudflare will cache all of your images and your CSS and your fonts. Your site will be lightning fast. It's very, very easy to use this kind of combination to get down from about four seconds to about two seconds in literally in 10 minutes. It's pretty cool. Um, optimizing your resources feels fairly obvious, like big chunky images and video are big and chunky, but there's some clever tricks you can use. Um, one of my favorite solutions for image optimization at the moment is TinyPNG. This is really good for systematic improvements. So they have a really good API that you can integrate. They've got a plugin for WordPress. The API works with other stuff. Let's say you're uploading 10 images a day as part of your editorial process. This runs in the background and just sorts them out for you. It's quite good. If you fancy something a bit more hands-on, Squoosh is really good. I've been playing with this recently. It's much better for I have one specific image that I really want to optimize. And it gives you this slide of experience and a whole bunch of settings. And you can compare before and after. And you can tick boxes. And you can open up all sorts of advanced stuff. And you can really micromanage 
how do I make this image as small, this specific image as small as possible um, without compromising on the look? Really powerful. Some advanced stuff you can do. Um, it might be that depending on your technical and hosting setup, that you probably shouldn't be hosting your images and your media. It might make more sense to put them into something like Amazon S3. If you're in WordPress, there is a plugin that I don't think I've linked to called Offload, S3 Offload, I think. Um, it's really good for that. Uh, it's really nice to store your media centrally so that it's not clogging up your system. Um, if you want to be really advanced, you can use an image CDN. Cloudinary and ImageX are good. These allow you to um, store your images in their system. They optimize it on the fly, and then you can do things like, say, I want to load this in black and white, or I want to load this rotated by 90 degrees, and it all happens automatically. You can hook those up with Cloudflare to get twice the benefit. Um, one of the things I will touch on briefly is you should modularize your CSS and JavaScript. This gets into kind of slightly more hardcore developer stuff. There are some WordPress plugins and tools and techniques you can use to do it from the outside, but really this is about how you build moving forwards. This is a screenshot of the um, coverage report in the Chrome developer tools. Um, and this is showing of all the CSS and JavaScript I've loaded, how much of that is being used by the page we're on. So we're on the home page. You can see the second line in that purple area I've highlighted as a CSS file. We're not using 89.2% of that. That's our main style sheet. That's all of our color rules and font rules and layout rules. The home page is barely using 10% of that, but we've loaded all the rest of that. That's a lot of time transferring those points. That's a lot of time for the browser to interpret those and decide which ones it's going to read and ignore. That's a lot of overhead wasted. If we built this in a way where we said, actually, we know that we only need this bit of CSS on the About Us page, or we know that we only need this bit on the contact form. We can load that conditionally in different files, and we can manage that and be much more efficient. You might want to consider, and this is controversial, I'll come into why, using AMP. If, if what I've talked about feels out of reach uh, because you are, because it's technical and advanced, or because you don't have the development resources, or because you don't have access to easily change your site, or you're on a custom CMS, or any number of other reasons that this feels out of reach, AMP could be a magic wand for you. Um, if you're not familiar with AMP, uh, go to AMP.dev. AMP is a um, new framework and standard for HTML, essentially. And it was heavily, heavily pioneered by Google. And it's now much more open than it was. It's now got a consortium of other people involved in it. But at its heart, it's an attempt to fix how broken and slow the internet is, particularly the mobile web. So rather than... Um, Rather than building your site with normal HTML and JavaScript and CSS, you use the AMP framework. And it is lightning fast. Like, you can literally ignore everything I've told you. Just use AMP, and it will do all of this and more automatically for you. Your site will load new on instantly. It will automatically improve itself over time. Everything will be really, really nice, except you're very limited in um, how much customization you can achieve because you're constrained by um, their guidelines and their restrictions. But that's opened up recently, um, but it's still quite difficult. It's more technically complicated to customize, especially through custom JavaScript. So all of your adverts, all of your custom conversion stuff, all of your analytics is going to be constrained. Um, also, ideologically, because Google is so heavily involved in the AMP framework as a kind of new version of the internet, you might have thoughts on the implications of that for the future of the open web and for um, open standards and for equal access um, to all things internet. It has ramifications. It's worth um, really looking into that and making a, a decision on both the technical and ideological constraints and seeing if it's right for you. If you would like to dip your feet in and you're on WordPress, the quote unquote official AMP for WordPress plugin, which is um, again, uh, involved, Google are involved in that, WordPress are involved in that, a whole bunch of big agencies are all collaborating on this. It's really awesome. Um, you can click and just turn it on and it will automatically convert your templates into AMP. You can do it in a test environment and you can see how well that works. It's getting really, really good to the point where you can just transform your normal site into an AMP site automatically. And then again, you can ignore everything I've told you and just run AMP code and it will do all this for you. Um, so that's the sort of stuff we've been doing and I'm pleased to tell you that this isn't just theory, this is real stuff. Um, we've gone through and done about half of that. We've still more to go. And you can see here that now on a desktop device, we're down from 625 milliseconds to under 400 mil. That's incredible. Absolutely insane. So well under half a second to get the whole site loaded. Never mind time to content, time to interact with that, et cetera. We're getting everything shipped in well under half a second because everything is small. Everything is fast. 
The browser is told what's going to happen through DNS prefetching and preloading. There are no bottlenecks because we removed all the slow stuff. All the images lazy load below the fold because I don't need them immediately. And all the analytics runs in Google Tag Manager after the page is done. It's not that complicated. It just took lots of tweaking and iteration and going in and shaving off a kilobyte here and a kilobyte there. That's six, seven months of work, maybe every other day or so spending a bit of time. This is achievable. What's even better is that on a mobile device, at least on Chrome Developer Console's 3G emulation, we are under two seconds, which actually was the original goal. Like if, if half of your users expect two seconds, if we can get under that, at least we're not irritating anybody. It would be nice to get faster and there's still work we can do, but that was pretty cool. So very quickly, because I've spent a lot of time rambling and I know there's a whole bunch of questions and I really want to um, help you guys out individually with your challenges. A few things that we're still looking at, which are interesting. Um, Worth noting that traditionally, if you're adopting AMP, the way you do that is you get a separate AMP page. Like, here's my blog post, and here's my AMP version of my blog post, and they have different URLs and they coexist. That's changing. And what Google are really pushing for and what the AMP project is really turning into is AMP just being the framework that you use. And you don't get two different versions. You get what we're calling canonical AMP, which is my page is in AMP. And in fact, the WordPress plugin will allow you to convert your existing pages, pages even to Canonical AMP. That's worth playing with. I haven't talked about what happens after load particularly, and this is a whole different talk and a whole different thing, but it's really worth considering and not forgetting that the experience somebody has once it's done still impacts their perception and their overall user experience. If it loads lightning fast and if everything is delivered instantly and then it feels clunky to load, because when I click on stuff, it's not obvious that something's happened or an animation is a bit janky and jittery, then it doesn't matter how much work you've done because it feels slow. Um, if you are interested in doing some clever stuff with modularizing CSS, go check out the blog post I wrote recently. Uh, if you're on WordPress, even if you're not, the principles are quite interesting. On if you want to start from scratch and build something lightning fast, here's a really cool approach. Um, you should definitely, um, if you've got some time to get into what happens after post load, go and check out this um, post by Emily Heyman. It's really nice. It's about how you make all your animations smooth. And if you want to do things like move things around on mouse over or on hover or on click, there's some really good techniques to make sure that doesn't feel slow. Um, I have a whole bunch of resources, which I won't bore you with. I'll skip through these. But when you get the deck, um, which you will do afterwards, and it'll be online, um, you can go through and tidy through all of these. Very, very quickly, in principle, there are some links to some awesome other people who have some similar talks and some similar resources at various levels of complexity. Um, you should go and check out Cloudflare. You should go and read everything in the Web Fundamentals documentation. And in particular, you should go and read everything that Ilya Grigorik has ever written. This is him on Twitter. He's well worth following. This is the performance guru at um, Google. He writes a lot of their content. He's defining a lot of what best practice looks like for this sort of stuff. I said earlier, um, performance used to be an art, and now it's a science. This is why. It's this guy. It's this one man is making it a, a, a science, and he's phenomenal. It's well worth going through and reading everything he's writing. Um, there's links to a whole bunch of stuff in this, all the links from all the different charts and all the stuff. I put little sparkly hearts next to the stuff, which are particularly um, good and easy starting points. If you want to dive in and get some quick wins, you can go look through all of that. I think that's just about everything for me. It's time for Q&A for you guys to go out and win like rainbow unicorn kittens. That is it for me. Thank you very much. Let's do some Q&A. Thanks, John. Survived. As always, Phenomenal information. I think you know this is just really one of the better uh, webinars I, I've been involved with. I will say, oh, too kind. Uh, Thank there, you. There, there's a lot of comments, um, you know, in some of the questions that are like about developers. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more. But one thing yeah. I would say is we are going to have this as a recorded video. Um, if you if you feel that you need your developers to sit down and watch this, I would highly <laughs> recommend that you sit down with them because there's a lot of language that gets kind of muddled when you go back and try to reiterate this to them. So I would definitely grab this video, show it to them. And also with re regard to Ilya Grigoric, um, definitely um, he was one of the ones that I uh, actually had on Search Engine Nerds very early on in our series oh, nice. uh, years ago. Um, he wrote the social elements for uh, Google Analytics. That was what he was originally uh, brought into Google when his company was acquired. This guy is WC3. He is speed. He is proper fundamentals of loading. He is and he's lovely. You know, he's really, really he's nice. Really, really, really nice guy. In fact, after we did the podcast, because I kind of sucked some information out of him, I don't think Google was happy about. He said he wouldn't do any more. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't do any more marketing podcasts. But he uh, definitely is in the search engine nerds uh, history there. If you want to go read a little bit about him and and um, you know service worker and some of the work he was doing with um, 
on all of that at that time. Um, we have a bunch of questions. I do want to dive into these questions, um, and, and, and some of them are, I think, are, are really good, you know, for, for answering these. These are the questions I hear a lot, and right off the bat, um, there is a lot of, of bad WordPress plugins. We know this, right? I mean, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. People, people go to get a plugin to add a period after a sentence. It's, it's, it's yes. kind of crazy, yep. but um, every time, and you mentioned this earlier, every time you add a plugin, you're, you're, you're taking a, a bit of a step back in performance for doing that. I'm, th that's a broad statement, but I think over, overarchingly it's kind of true. Um, so if there's so many bad WordPress plugins and a lot of people don't understand this or don't even know how to work with their developers, is WordPress a choice for a website that people should be considering? Hell yeah, WordPress is always the choice. There are no other choices. No, I'm, I'm, I'm biased towards WordPress because I, I live and breathe it. But I think, um, I, so I think plugins aren't inherently bad. Plugins aren't inherently slow. And as I said earlier, sometimes you add a plugin to achieve some functionality, and because functionality takes time, the plugin takes time. That said, yes, there are a lot of bad plugins. There are a lot of slow plugins. Um, the performance one I perform performance monitoring plugin I mentioned, Query Monitor, is really good for identifying particularly slow plugins. You can, um, in its reports, you can filter it and say, show me my plugin. And it will very quickly point out that all your other plugins are taking this long. This plugin is taking 100 times that long. This is an issue. And then you can shop around and find, um, find an alternative. Uh, the, the bigger plugins are usually good, because if they're big, they're successful, which means they're monetizing or, or some of that, which means typically they have proper development skills and teams behind them. The smaller ones are where the risks are. And yeah, definitely for things you can do yourself, don't don't rely on a plugin if you don't have to. Don't add one for adding a period after a sentence, as you say. But yeah, like you, and, and in fact, the, the opposite is, the, the flip side is true. I think WordPress is the easiest platform in the world to speed up with plugins. So I did this myself. I, I'm, I'm a performance nerd and historically I've always handcrafted everything. I love WordPress, but I've always built themes myself, etc. I recently redid my website and I bought an off the shelf theme and I thought, I'm going to dog food this, I'm going to make it fast. My site loads in half a second using an off-the-shelf theme, using a ton of plugins, 25 or so plugins, most of which are different flavors of performance optimization or functionality. I added a whole bunch of stuff. You can make it fast so easily. It took me an afternoon, and I'm well under half a second, or at least under so a second. You can, so you can see right off the bat that, I mean, it's not necessarily a clear-cut case of WordPress is good or bad. Plugins oh, are okay. good or bad. Themes are good or bad. It's about getting the right ones. I do want to take a quick moment. You guys can see what's on the screen here. Um, we have a, I want to just mention a webinar that we have coming up um, in a couple weeks on May 8th uh, about how to improve e-commerce SEO with user-generated content. Um, just want to plug that and make sure that you know that this is coming up. Going to be a very interesting um, webinar, um, definitely something people have been asking for about e-commerce and content, so something to pay attention to. Um, coming back a little bit, I think a lot of this uh, stuff with development comes back to People don't know how to put a developer on point. So there's a lot of questions in here that go along the <laughs> yeah. line of how do I clean up a website? How do I find developers to do the speed properly? How do I, you know, and, and, and it's really tough because you're dealing with a language you don't know. It's like, how do you know your mechanics doing the right thing? Do you yes. have any quick advice for people to check their developers to make sure like what is their qualifications is there certain experience factors is there certain language questions you can ask um, that could help people find out they're on the right track with their developers oh that's really interesting i'm not aware of anything like that and i really wish there was and we have the same problem in seo right it's like it's a it's both are industries which are largely uncodified there is no university of website speed or seo or analytics or this so yeah i think a lot of it will come down to are they using the same kind of language which is used in the Google Web Fundamentals documentation? Like if they're talking about time to interactive and first meaningful paint, then at least they understand the concepts. And then the rest of it is fairly easy to do. They can just follow the guidelines. But if they don't have that base understanding of what speed is, I tend to find a lot with developers that they focus um, too much on either the front or the back end. They're like, I'll obsess about, they'll obsess about, um, let's speed up the database when it's not the database that's slow, it's the way in which um, CSS is loading custom fonts on the front end. Or they'll obsess about the JavaScript optimization when it takes two seconds for the server to respond. 
Um, you can spot those bottlenecks in the Chrome developer console or web page test or et cetera. And you can see if there are bits that are obviously unloved. Like you want somebody who's balancing and improving the most sensible bits. And you can see that in those bottleneck reports and where the issues are. So, so yeah. So go, go through through a, little bit, uh, a little bit of a lightning round. Let's jump through some things and, and let's kind of see if we can get some quick answers out there. And then everybody knows how to find Jana. We'll make sure they can find you. We can follow up and get some you know, expanded answers on this. Um, yeah, I'm always happy to tweet it, et cetera. Uh, HTML validation, we, you know, the, the conversation around WC3 HTML validation, a lot of this validation has kind of uh, disappeared, right? <laughs> How yeah. important is that today? I, I'm a big fan of it um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I, I, I know it's fallen out of favor in the SEO world because Google is smart enough to understand your messy HTML, but um, it's better for accessibility. It's better for your your browser has to pass that HTML and make decisions on what it thinks it should be, and that takes milliseconds. Chrome is really really good at this. If you have broken HTML, it will make the most of it and work it out. That takes resource, so it's definitely a speed implementation in, in speed um, implication. And um, also, some of um, Cloudflare's advanced caching stuff requires your HTML to be valid, um, which many people don't know. So it's worth doing. Like, don't invest millions on it, but if it is achievable, then it's worth the, the incremental benefit. Now, you mentioned earlier, I want to throw this out there with JavaScript. There's a question in here that I want to get in that's, you know, about fonts. Should you load fonts with JavaScript after the initial load instead of using uh, HTML? But even further with, uh, you know, I want you to answer that question about, you know, is it better to do JavaScript font loading after you finish the page instead of within the HTML? But also, you know, with JavaScript, I think it's important to throw out there that it's not just a JavaScript is not as good as WordPress or JavaScript is not, you know, as ideal. It's really fundamentally a problem with indexing and, and, yep. and, and um, you know, it's a problem with the two-part indexing that Google has. A lot of people don't understand that, that Google indexes HTML and then they come back and they render in a second yep. pass. For jo and so JavaScript is rendered in that second pass. And so it's a lot harder to index things as fast. You definitely have to validate with some really good JavaScript. <laughs> You're gonna if you're gonna be indexed as well. So when you're playing with Java, you need to really be careful. And Google is yeah, trying like, to be, yeah. You, go ahead and speak yeah. to that. And also please about the, the fonts. And about the fonts, yeah. So yeah, so JavaScript in 30 seconds or less. Um, JavaScript is phenomenal and powerful and incredible. And you can achieve things with it, which um, you would never be able to achieve. Otherwise you can do incredible things in the browser. Um, however, you can do that very badly, very easily. And the kinds of developers who understand JavaScript and SEO well enough to do that right, and there is a right way of doing it and 99 wrong ways, they are very, very rare. And they're still just coming out of the woodwork very slowly. It's very easy to build a beautiful, incredibly sophisticated site and a front end in JavaScript on, in, any, in any scenario on top of any CMS and have Google be completely unable to digest it. Um, so fonts. Um, uh, your mileage will vary. There are different approaches. I'm currently working with um, some people at Google. Uh, Ilya Bugarek chipped in actually on um, a standard approach for loading fonts in a more efficient way. Um, if you look at the Web Fundamentals documentation for web fonts, there's some really good stuff there about um, the right combinations of CSS, inlining, um, loading external resources, and using JavaScript. And there's essentially a workflow of use this particular CSS in this scenario put it in this order, put this JavaScript afterwards, and it gives you the best kind of combination of those. And I'm not aware of many people in the world doing that yet, but it is a cheat sheet, it's really good. Last question I wanna pluck out, we still have a bunch of questions, unfortunately we just can't get to them all everybody, but I will send them over to Jono afterwards, and we'll I see if we can't get them answered for the blog post. Yeah, I'll spend the question. more answering questions. <laughs> yeah, last question kind of for, for the, the live version of this, international sites, how do you gauge international speed? Oh, that's really interesting. So yeah, if, um, if I if my server is in London and half my users are in Australia, they're going to get a slow time. So most of the tools like Pingdom's web page test, uh, so Pingdom's page tools, web page tests, GT metrics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even will let you select where you want to test it from, and then you can obviously run multiple tests from different countries. And um, you will find that it gets um, a second or so slower by every country that you pass through. Like the now, speed of light is a real issue. Is um, there a standard though? Is there like a because we talk about like the U.S. wants a certain standard? Is there a international standard? Is there a site that tells you what the standards are? Is it only the U.S. that's doing speed right now and nobody else is? Or 
Um, I see, um, so this is something Cloudflare is trying to solve. I don't think there is a standard, but they have a really nice toy, a toy, a really nice tool called Argo, which is designed to speed up those international connections by routing them more intelligently. That will patch over some of the issue, but the challenge with that could really doing properly localized speed is that you need a server nearby to where the people are. And while CDNs like Cloudflare will solve that for things like images, they'll serve it from around the corner from your house. And um, it's harder to serve the website itself without having some quite sophisticated technical setup. So you can get some quick wins with something like Cloudflare's Argo and uh, offloading all your images in JavaScript, but ultimately you're going to be adding a couple of seconds if your server is in Amsterdam and you're trying to serve to people in Japan. There's not a lot you can do about that uh, other than hope that that's the general experience that those customers have wherever they shop because geography is a thing um, and hope that you're not much worse than your competitors. Awesome. Thanks, Jono, again for joining no, thank you. us for all the information. I'm going to send you over a list uh, in an email real quick of some questions that were left over. We'll get those answered. We'll get them into the uh, blog post recap. So, uh, you know, everyone who's you know listening, we'll try to get those available to you. And, uh, you know, if you have more questions, send them over. Otherwise, you know, look for the recap. And Jono, again, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing so much great information. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Catch you later. Cheers.